I know you get the idea of attracting people online, attracting, let me be clear, attracting the perfect client online and that being the path to better pricing, more profitability and all that. But how do I start attracting people? Honestly, I think right now the best way may be with a killer digital product for a very specific type of person. So today, we're gonna talk through how you have everything that you need in your noggin right now to put together said product. You just gotta stop overthinking it. And then, we're going full challenge episode. We will generate some mega specific niches and how that digital product would apply specifically to that domain, because that's what you gotta do. Some general product, nobody's gonna buy it. But that thing for beekeepers, now we're talking. Come on in, let's make our first Louis digital product. Okay, how do you stand out in all the noise? On social media, you got people like me shouting and they've got production budgets now and there's all these increasingly impressive things happening on social media. So why is somebody gonna listen to me rather than Charlie D'Amelio, right? The answer, my friend, specificity. And when it comes to getting attention for your accounting firm, I just really grapple with the notion that anybody's gonna win the day marketing on the back of an accounting firm. like. Put your finger on one accounting firm who has advertised themselves as an accounting firm and taken over social media, right? Oh, wait, I don't think that firm exists. Maybe somebody will do it someday, but the much easier thing is for you, the person, to come through and solve painful pains for people. And where I see that happening most in the wild and kind of that current social media meta is people making a super useful digital product around a specific pain point and that becoming a really cool business. And I'm very much about doing less in an accounting firm. And I get how that is contradictory to a daily podcast, to new ideas. But I honestly think the path to doing less is is somehow finding somebody who will pay you much more and leaning more into one to many. And products are the most pure form of one to many, right? It's a thing that you can put up out there. People can consume it 24 seven and One more person consuming it doesn't require any incremental effort from you. I have now built my life around one to many, and let me tell you, it's a wild drug. Uh, In fact, my YouTube channel dashboard for just for the main channel is up right now. In the last 24 hours, something like 1,500 people have watched my videos in the last 24 hours. Imagine taking meetings with 1,500 people in one day. That'd be a lot, that'd be a big day. But most of us aren't leaning into this at all. Or we see people on the other side of quote unquote success and you think, well, geez, that feels forever away. But it's more like a permanent mind shift, I think. It's more, how do I spend my time rather than exclusively doing one-on-one stuff, acknowledging that you need to start investing in more scalable stuff. So while I am very anti doing more, in fact, I think the next daily pod will be just a list of things you can stop doing. So while I am right now, I I feel like more than ever, I need to put that punk rock messaging out that less is more because coaches and software vendors and all of these people are telling you that you need to do more because generally they have something to sell, unfortunately, but I'm not playing that game. So I can give it to you straight. Usually the answer isn't to do more, but in this case, the answer is to do a new thing. And it comes at the trade-off of, of more client work, right? So if we are trying to get our ourselves to a more scalable place, it is how do I not spend 100% of my time pouring all my efforts into one-on-one client work? How do I just start taking a step into like, okay, now this part of my business is one too many and this part of my business is scalable. That's how I started. And now I'm like beside myself if I have to touch anything that isn't scalable. Like I hate getting on one-on-one meetings with people like, totally honest. Like software companies to reach out anymore. I'm just like, no, like that feels like a super wasteful use of my time. And so the risk is you become a total snowflake like me, but you have to like start wading into this. And I actually think when it comes to attracting the best one-on-one types of work, the non-scalable stuff, the clients who will pay you three X what anybody pays you now, the answer to attracting them is one to many. So they kind of go hand in hand. Right now, if I was running an accounting practice, I could have a level of client that is so much higher than I could have ever imagined having before because of my one-to-many stuff. 
So the two things kind of go hand in hand. So very nuts and bolts, a digital product. We did a whole episode before, maybe we'll link that at the end, around accountants selling things to accountants, where we talked about a little bit of this. But I'll tell you why I'm hot on just selling a single digital product that is not a huge thing, is man, I'm seeing more and more people online, quote unquote influencers, that have built their entire life around like a 60 minute product, a 90 minute product. Imagine that, like shooting a 60 minute thing and the rest of your life is just selling that thing. That is wild. Uh, Justin Welsh on Twitter is maybe the best example of this. He has his content OS thing that's 90 minutes long. The kind of thing that, man, it sure feels like you could put together in an afternoon. I'm pretty sure it's a loom recording. Like this is not a fancy production. And all he does besides having that thing to sell is just posts on social media and like spreads his thought leadership that way. And people who like it come back and they find this thing and they buy it from it. And it's not very, it's not very expensive, but that guy's clearing like two or three million bucks a year right now on his one little itty bitty course that costs, I don't remember what it is, 300 bucks, 200 bucks that he made, I have to guess in an app. And if that doesn't make you feel sad, I honestly, I don't know what will. But I think this is how we can start to lean into the same drug. Now, I had this quote from uh, Alex Hermosi's $100 million offers that I want to repeat again because this is so important when you are thinking about a thing to make. It's a little table that he had in his book, and I've spun this out like a bunch of different ways that are more relevant to us, but I'll just, here's exactly what he has in the book. Little table with four rows. Product, time management, price $19. Product, time management for sales professionals, price $99. Product, time management for outbound B2B sales, price $499. Product, time management for outbound B2B power tools and gardening sales reps, price $1,997. You get the idea. A digital product for e-com companies. Not specific enough. Digital product for e-com companies who use QuickBooks. Not specific enough. Like, you gotta go deep. Uh, and I know we get afraid of going deep because it's gonna exclude more and more people, but... As they say, uh, with niche stuff, the more specific you get, the easier it is to find that very specific type of person. And those two things in our heads are very much in conflict. What do you mean if I like make this relevant to fewer people, I'm gonna then be able to find more people? I'm not a scientist, but that's just how it works. You gotta get very specific. This episode is sponsored in part by the fine folks at Cloud Accountant staffing. Do you hire accountants? Bless your little heart. Uh, not the best part of the job, in my opinion. Not something I ever enjoyed. Well, listen, you can build your accounting dream team, dream team. with talented offshore accountants in the Philippines that work 100% full-time for your firm. Their accountants aren't freelancing or contracting for multiple firms. They're all yours. They work exclusively for you and are incentivized to stay with you and your team long-term. They're not gonna get swiped. Cloud Account Staffing is 100% dedicated to the accounting industry and founded by a former accounting firm owner that understands your business, knows your pain points. They had to hire some accountants and they said, you know what, we're gonna build our own pipeline in the Philippines. Gonna pull in some super talented people and then open that up to other firms. Basically, that's the story. Uh, we've been talking about, a lot about staffing, building more resilient staffing pipelines for your firms. I, I had staff in the Philippines, I, like totally red pilled me to like, oh geez, like we need to globalize the way that we get our work done. Uh, check these folks out. Link in the show description, cloudaccountantstaffing.com. Theme, let me tell you, uh, this episode is sponsored in part by Copilot, the portal that makes all of your wildest, your wildest, wildest, dreams come true within the business context. Name of the game with Copilot is flexibility. The notion that you can build that client portal to do any old thing you want it to do because your needs, they're unique. You know, us accountants, we are absolute snowflakes. Nobody understands the problems that our clients have quite like we do, which makes nobody more equipped to know what they need than me. Don't tell me how to work with my client, how to collaborate with them on a website. You're lucky I don't know how to make the software because I'd make just what my client needed and they would love it. Well, gang, that day is here because Copilot gives you the ultimate flexible platform to put any old thing you want in that portal. Totally customize each section, customize what different clients and different client groups see because your clients aren't just a bunch of drones that are all the exact same and need the exact same thing. 
And if you really wanted to be that locked down and serve everybody the exact same way, then you'd be off running some sort of software startup that's just gonna serve up this vanilla, lame, boring version that's the same for everybody, doesn't take into account their actual needs. That's not you though, you're better than that, okay? And get a client portal that'll lean into the snowflake that you are and the specific needs your clients have. Is that a bad thing to say? Does Snowflake have like too many negative connotations? You know what I mean. Nobody understands the nuance like you do, okay? And Copilot's the portal that'll meet you in the middle. Learn more about this one uh, at the link in the show notes. So if I'm gonna put out a digital product, I think we talked about this a bit before, but like my insecurities and my imposter syndrome pushed me to make this really big ambitious thing. Well, somebody's gonna give me money for this. Like it's gotta be big. You know, maybe it's actually a cohort of like an eight week learning series. Maybe it's this like episodic 10 hour thing. No, stop it. Nobody wants that because nobody has time to drop what they're doing for eight weeks. Nobody has time to like go through this whole sweaty cohort thing. Rule of thumb, if you're making a thing, make it 90 minutes or less. Because what people want to buy is a transformation that can happen in the next couple hours. Not a transformation that's going to require them to get a babysitter and request some time off work and put off that landscaping project. And the good news about that for you is when you do this for the first time, man, it's going to suck. Like it is going to be bad. You're going to make this thing and then you're going to be like, oh, I didn't ever even think about how I'm going to market this or promote it and then nobody buys it. There's going to be a whole lot of reasons why nobody will want to buy this first thing that you make. Two things there, like don't stress over the production quality. If Justin Welsh can make millions of dollars on his stupid little loom recording, uh, your beekeepers, like they're not gonna care. Like they're gonna be even one step below that where they're like, wow, something like an accountant on video? Come look at this, Marty. Like they're not gonna be concerned about production value at all. So you're gonna be your own worst enemy when it comes to how impressive it is. But then second, like if you absolutely have to, like, yeah, you could do it again. And that's the nice part of having this small kind of thing that isn't this big mega lift. But I would really like stress, don't overthink it. So what can we build that we can pack into 90 minutes? I'm telling you, it is a whole bunch of stuff that is already bouncing around in that noodle. So I want you to keep this thing within 90 minutes and let's just boil this down to the top X things that you see people get wrong, like the biggest, most financial driving uh, mistakes and opportunities that you don't see people taking advantage of in that space. And I say in that space because we're gonna make it very specific to the type of person who you want to consume it, but most of these things are the same across all spaces. Not all, but many of them. So if you do tax and accounting, man, what are your five top things for tax and your five top things for top things for accounting? If you just do accounting, what are your five top things for accounting? So we all have this probably just bounce around in our heads because we have these conversations all day, every day. Let me run through just a smattering of stuff that's just general stuff that you could plug into this. So starting with tax stuff, just thinking through the emails that you get from clients and, and stuff like that. I know in a past challenge episode, we had this thing where we're like, how do we build a killer offer for clothing resellers? And we talked about, you know, regulation and how you can get in trouble there. Like maybe there's a trap where people within this space very often fall into this trap that can be costly. Think about that. Like what are the things you most see people get wrong? But also, and we're still talking tax here and apologies for the non-US people. We're going to get through this fast. And the selection, that old chestnut. Sticking real estate in your S Corp, like not making an S election or making an S election when that was a bad idea. Uh, fringe things that are not deductible, but then also fringe things that are deductible that may surprise them. And this like, don't, don't like make this a charged thing, like point to authoritative stuff. Like this isn't you saying it. This is you saying, well, here it actually says, no, sorry, you can't do that. So what are the, what are the things that may surprise them that are out of bounds within what they do, but also those things that are inbounds. How about like some background on IRS audits? Like, uh, if you've been through any audits, what are, like, I guess, give them a kind of a picture into that process and where are the places where they can lose money, particularly if you've gone through audits with that type of company before. Uh, ERC and the nuance that is specific to their space as it applies to ERC. Obviously, that's a huge one right now. Optimizing Cuban. 
And a lot of this stuff, you're going to be like, well, that takes a PhD in, in taxonomics to understand. Like, don't be afraid to make a really simplistic version of that, to like chuck something in a spreadsheet and be like, hey, you're not going to attach this to your tax return, but this will at least like give you a head start on here's how to think about it. Within the scope of this digital product, like we are telling them, here's the things that probably make sense for you to do. Now, are they going to go out and do all this on their own? They could certainly try. And you can put that information out there to say, like, generally, this is what's going to be helpful. But ultimately, it's one of those situations where I don't think you have to really be afraid of giving away the farm because they're going to come back around to you and ask you to do it. Like, this is how you're establishing your expertise. Now, accounting stuff. That was tax stuff. And every country is going to have their own version of tax stuff. Man, when I was in Australia, whew, it's just... It made me more aware of the like regulatory jargon that we all use and just how location specific all that junk is. I'm sorry to all of you Canadians and other foreigners who listen to this podcast for just how much none of this tax stuff makes sense. But accounting stuff. What are the top five, you know, accounting things that you see people get wrong here? I actually think there's a lot of opportunities here around system design, right? So the integrations that maybe people aren't taking advantage of, the integrations that suck and aren't worthwhile, third-party tools. I'm doing, uh, you may have seen, I'm doing demo days, which are sponsored videos on Wednesdays on my main channel now. We just did our first one for Keeper this week. Next week, we're doing one for uh, Makers Hub, which is an accounts payable automation platform. And man, I had a couple clients who did job costing and would just have these huge gnarly invoices and purchase receipts with all the detail, the stuff that they had to buy. And I had like two people sitting there, like putting all that stuff in. And it was a nightmare. And if I had known about like Makers Hub or if this was the thing that was around then, which automates a massive percentage of this, something like that, that I could put in a guide here, like that could save like an FTE or more of somebody's time. So when it comes to accounting tips, there's probably accounting platform stuff. Like what are the things people get wrong in that platform? Maybe there's classification stuff that people get wrong, but there's probably a big opportunity in like systems stuff. Maybe even actually like payroll and HR stuff as well. But systems, you know, your receipt banks, your digital bill pay platforms, a lot of those things we take for granted. But how many of your clients really have that stuff nailed? And if you can present that, um, it's hard to give really general advice on that stuff. But if you're talking to a very specific type of person, you can give them really helpful, really pointed advice, like through a really practical lens that's like, man, there's one client that I helped do this. And that was like half of a client, half of an employee's time. And they got to go use that person to go do sales or something like that. Again, we're we're not even like, we don't want to go past 90 minutes on this thing. So most of us, we have that stuff bouncing around in our head already. There's probably even more stuff that's very, very specific to that type of person. But don't feel like you need to limit it to just beekeeper exclusive stuff, right? Beekeepers have problems with entity selection too, with man, issuing 1099s. Like what are the common things that all businesses struggle with? Just put it through the lens that's for that very specific type of person. Because when you go specific enough, I venture to guess there isn't anybody else doing that. We had somebody on a roast to firm on the main channel video selling to a super like hyper specific niche. And they had, they were just an online firm. They were the only one putting up messaging for that niche. And they had added like, I don't remember what it was, a half million, a million in the first year or something like that. It's just outrageous. For a very, very specific type of person where you're like, could you really build a firm around that specific of a thing? The answer is yes. So I think right now, and, and you can stand up your, your website, your landing page would be for this very specific person. And I think you probably should. But I think even more compelling than that is a thing that solves a pain. And like a digital product, I think that's a great way to do that. We've talked about the notion of standing up an offer and selling an offer before you pull people into ongoing services because when they have that great experience going through the process of the offer and you fixing a, you know, helping them with a meaningful problem and they're dazzled, they're gonna sign on. Like at that point, they can't imagine working with anybody else and they're gonna sign on it you know, 50% higher rates or 2x higher rates. Uh, A digital product may get you there to a degree as well. I don't know. 
2016. This episode is sponsored in part by the fine folks at Client Hub, where AI isn't the future, it's now, it's here. I guess it's both the future and now. But it is happening in the present. They're shipping cool stuff every day. I'm not just talking about it, they're doing it. They got a new landing page, Your Firm on GPT, where they kind of outline their vision for the stuff they've already shipped and the stuff that they are working on. Starting to get firms in on like early access to provide feedback on this stuff. Leveraging AI everywhere in Client Hub and yielding, how's this sound? 90 plus percent time savings in many aspects of the work in your firm. The three core concepts, they're building this around one, generate it using AI to generate stuff that normally you would have to do yourself. Think emails, tasks, that sort of thing. Answer it. Don't just search by text, a more intelligent version of text that sees into your meetings, your emails, all that stuff. A lot of the stuff we've been talking about on the show. And third, up-level it. Summarize meeting notes. Tell you what's inside a file without having to open it. Sentiment analysis. Whole bunch of cool stuff. In the coming weeks, we're going to be talking about like the actual stuff that they've shipped so far and the stuff that's coming soon. That is Client Hub. To learn more about that and what they're working on, check out the link in the show notes. Getting this episode is sponsored in part by Liveflow. Uh, Liveflow is the easiest way to sync that QuickBooks data back and forth to your spreadsheets. You may have seen this actually had a big announcement lately. So this fall, G2 gave them the top spot in their fall 2023 report as the leader in the financial analysis category. That's right, they won. Number one, nice work. Uh, if you've been around my channels for a while, you've seen Lifeflow kindly, they have sponsored quite a bit of stuff. And I'm not, I mean, I'm not saying I'm taking credit for it, but that was probably why. If not familiar with Liveflow, super easy way to sync that stuff, sync your QuickBooks data back and forth with Google Sheets. They got a whole pile of templates too to make the process of building that stuff for the first time as easy as possible for you. Stuff for managing cash, AP, KPIs, like everything you can imagine. Sync that data into your existing sheets to make them smarter, get it to auto sync or build your like custom new sheets that talk with QuickBooks totally from scratch. Uh, pretty cool tool. Check that one out at lifeflow.io. Uh, and I also love the pure simplicity and shareability of a digital product, particularly if you're doing stuff like getting out on the conference circuit and trying to get in front of this type of person more and more. Oftentimes, you can be dazzled by somebody in the context of a conference, but there isn't a clear call to action to learn more from them and consume more from them. That's a super explicit call to action where you're like, all I do is work with this type of people. They get a lot of stuff wrong. I save them a lot of money. Here's like a bite-sized version of that. That's 1500 bucks that you can go get tomorrow or something like that. Again, if we get anything wrong here, it's we overthink it. We take for granted all the knowledge that we have that our clients don't have. And we don't get specific enough about who it's for. And don't get hung up on like, oh, I don't have a hundred of these clients already. If that type of client came in the door tomorrow, what would you tell them? Like that is what we need to be building this messaging around. Okay, so here's what we're gonna do. Oh, one other thing. Once you do that, like, man, you could even like spin that into a book pretty quick and easy, I feel like. Like once you've got the transcript and the outline there, whoo, hire a ghostwriter, like flesh it out a little further. You're pretty darn close to a book at that point. And for some reason, books just never go away. Like they just have a level of staying power and, and legitimacy. Oh, wow. Somebody wrote a financial and tax strategy book for beekeepers. Now we're talking. Uh, for some reason, that just has a different air of legitimacy. Okay, but enough about beekeepers. We're going to generate some super specific niches and think through how that digital product could look for them and how you build a, like a social media strategy around that type of person. Okay, give me three hyper-specific niches that my accounting and tax preparation firm could serve. If you're watching on video, I pulled this up now. I'm looking for nuanced, quirky stuff. This is probably a terrible idea doing this live. Cryptocurrency traders and miners. Gosh, dang it. It always does crypto stuff when I do this. Food truck owners. I think that might be a repeat as well. Uh, but that's a good one. I like that. Digital nomads and remote workers living abroad. Okay, food truck owners, that's probably good. The other ones, not specific enough. Uh, I'm gonna say, give me a more specific version of number one, enhance. <laughs> okay, day traders of NFT-based virtual real estate, nerd alert. Okay, actually, this is killer. So the whole notion of buying virtual real estate on platforms like Decentraland, The Sandbox, there's a good number of those people out there. Man, that's actually great. I don't know if many people who listen to this do Web3 stuff. 
But you want to talk about specific nuanced needs, not only NFTs, but NFT-based virtual real estate. Because yeah, oh gosh, can you imagine the marketing, like you can market yourself like a real estate agent, but it's actually NFT-based virtual real estate. So you got like the big hair, you've got the email signature with your picture in it. You know what I'm talking about. Okay, what would a digital product look like for these nerds? I can say that because I'm super, super a nerd. So if I'm a tax and accounting firm, uh, boy, this one kind of writes itself. What are the big tax issues? Ugh, honestly, it could be stuff as simple as, you know, you may have a pretty small, like low volume business and not setting aside the appropriate amount of money if you have a big sale or something like that. There's gotta be, this is one where you may not even have to lean into the general advice so much because there's so many nuanced considerations within this specific space. The one thing you want to look out for with the digital product is as much as possible, you want it to be evergreen. And this is one where it may require updating certain chapters. But that being said, if you're using a platform like Kajabi or, or something like that, if you chunk this content into chapters, which is the best thing to do, you can then update things in a, in a modular way. So it's not like this 90 minute single thing that I shot, where if one thing changes, you're like, crap, throwing out the whole thing, right? You want to avoid that. Boy, NFT-based virtual real estate, that seems like a super easy thing to build some advice around how to hold the real estate, uh, how you account for that stuff. This is one where I'm so dumb, I don't, I, I'm struggling to even figure out how you build that digital product. But a person that actually knows this stuff, that would be absolutely no problem. And imagine, imagine if you are one of those people that is like super into that virtual real estate stuff. Imagine finding that account. Like that's what we're trying to get to is that level of specificity because it's the sort of thing where you'll stop dead in your tracks and you're like, this is the one person in the world that is for me. And the best thing about the internet is every post is like a lighthouse to find those people. Uh, and you just have to turn up consistently. You have to go on the shows, go on the things that they consume. And when they find you, they are like, you are the one person in the universe for me. And if I'm starting a firm tomorrow that is, I need tax and accounting. And I go out and I'm like scrapping at chamber meetings and stuff like that. Or if I get super specific, and maybe my lead flow is going to be way, way less as a result. But the thing is, I can charge like five to 10x the rates of a brand new firm. That is the firm that I want to run. Like, because that is where you have a super profitable practice. Like that digital product business may even become really profitable. And for people who go down this path, if you end up building a killer business around a digital product, that's perfectly okay. Like I'm probably one of those people. And that's, I'm in a super privileged position now where I like, I tried this higher leverage thing and it actually became a business. That's not a bad outcome in all of this. Okay. The second niche, we got to go through three here. Food truck owners, yeah, that absolutely is going to have its own kind of unique set of accounting and tax issues. Maybe some of the accounting issues align with best practices for traditional restaurants. But if you even wanted to get more specific here, it could be like people who own a number of food trucks. That may be a way to go up market here. Uh, I don't know how big like businesses those solo food truck owners would be. But I know there's definitely people who are going out and like operate 10 or 20 of these things. Maybe that's who you actually want to go after, the food truck magnates. So they're going to have specialized accounting needs, especially if they are working multiple trucks. They're going to have specialized tax needs. What does ERC look like? I don't know. How does tip credit? Uh, tip credit, I know, is a big thing with restaurants that they get wrong a lot. Yeah, how does deductibility work around that? Is there any interesting things because they have these vehicles, but are they running up into like vehicle deductibility rules that maybe have different connotations when the truck is the business? And then number three was digital nomads and remote workers living abroad. But I want a more specific version of this. It gave me U.S. digital nomads working for European tech startups. So these are U.S. citizens who are remote working for European tech startups. Cool. Like, I would also be thinking about where are the hubs for these people. You could probably go direct to the startups and give those people really good information. And this could almost be like an employee perk. But that's super, super specific. And if you're one of those people in Europe, uh, you're a U.S. citizen, you're doing tech, but want to be in Europe, you have very unique tax needs. Who the heck is going to help you? Like international tax stuff, that's usually larger firms and you're just absolutely paying out the nose. Who's going to help you? 
that would be a really cool thing to build a, a niche practice around. And the way that you find those people is having those conversations consistently online every single day, but then prove your value, prove your worth by putting together a 90 minute digital product that digs into the issues specific to these people, common traps. And if they aren't already foaming at the mouth to work with you by the end of that digital product, you'll have whatever you want, a thousand bucks in your pocket just from that. And then they will be doubly wanting to work with you, right? And again, like what's stopping us from doing this? Because this is a thing where like this information is already in our heads. And this is like maybe half a day to put this together. Like this is not a huge lift. Don't overthink it. And honestly, maybe this is the thing that gives you enough of a mental ROI calculation to start publishing on social more. Like maybe this is another framing of it. Oh, I have this thing to sell now. Now it's going to be easier for me to justify posting twice a day on social and that, you know, leading to some sort of revenue opportunity or something like that, right? I don't know, whatever gets you there, but I'm just seeing more and more people making stupid amounts of money with digital products like this uh, and simultaneously people struggling with how am I going to attract that very specific type of person? This is a great thing to build your expertise around that if you do any of this, you are absolutely capable of making tomorrow. In fact, if you go out and you do this, tell me, I would love to see it. I would love to see what these bullet points are that you outline. And if you're open to it, I would love to circle back and be like, look at what these other accountants did who are listening to the show. Look at how they built this out, the, the, like the talking points they touched on, because I think the blocker for us beyond just getting out of our own head and doing it is like, what am I going to talk about? So having more of those data points, I think is helpful for everyone to ideate because when you go out and you make your US digital nomad working for European tech startups, digital product, I'm not worried about it taking away sales from my beekeeper product. So I think we can work together here, people. <laughs> All that is to say, if you do go out and do it, please share it with me. And I would love to then like share it back with, you know, this network and the folks tuning in here to uh, share some cool ideas. So that's all I got for today. Is it Friday? I think this publishes Friday. Great job, everybody. Oh my gosh. Is it the 15th when this publishes? It is. Bless your heart. Tax people in America. Great job. You just made it past. This is a meaningful deadline. Partnerships you can slip by another month. But great job. You probably got most of those S-corps out the door. Hang in there months ago. Thanks for coming and hanging. I'll see you in the next one.